Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar on housing concerns and disabilities. My name is Dr. Mary Hauser. I want to spend just a quick minute telling you a little bit about myself. My name is Mary Hauser, and I serve as an educational consultant uh, for the American College of Financial Services. My day job is um, an associate professor of special education at Westchester University of Pennsylvania, which is one of our state universities here in Pennsylvania. And I've been asked to speak to you today because of my expertise in disabilities, but also because I am currently working on creating an inclusive housing project um, here in Westchester for adults with developmental disabilities. So I have some personal expertise in um, the process. But today we're gonna look at a number of things. So I wanna take just a moment and look at our agenda. So first we're going to do a review of different types of disabilities so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about when I talk about adults with disabilities. We're gonna look at the history of housing adults with disabilities and so what things have looked like in the past for them. We're gonna then move on to what is called the Olmstead Act of 1999, which is a really pivotal um, result of a Supreme Court case that dealt with uh, housing and individuals or adults with disabilities. We're going to move on to family concerns about housing for adults with disabilities. Uh, we're going to talk about the Fair Housing Act of 1988. And then we're going to take a look at funding that's available for housing adults with disabilities. But just so that you know that my expertise is in disability, it is not in finance. So I am your disability end um, here. All right, so let's get started talking for just a few minutes about adults with disabilities. And when I talk to you about an adult, of course, I'm talking about someone who is 18 years of age or older. And typically, these individuals are going to possess one or more of the following disabilities that I have listed here to some kind of varying degree. Now, um, the categories of disabilities that I have listed here are um, from the federal government. And it's just a, it's an easy way to get a snapshot of all of the different disabilities that exist. And there are more than what appear here, but these are the major ones. So, we're talking about individuals with autism or autism spectrum disorder, learning disabilities, speech and hearing disabilities, intellectual disabilities, emotional and behavioral disorders, blindness, deaf blindness, hearing impairment, multiple disabilities, traumatic brain injury, other health impaired and physical disabilities. I want to take just a second and talk to you about a little bit about what each one of these look like. Now, autism or autism spectrum disorder, you might have heard about in recent years because there's been an, an incredible increase in the prevalence of individuals being identified with autism spectrum disorder. One in 59 people are now getting that diagnosis. And essentially that is um, a problem with communication and with uh, social interaction and repetitive and restrictive behaviors. And it's a spectrum disorder, so we have people who are very mildly affected to significantly affected. Individuals who have learning disabilities have a, a typical intelligence. However, they have problems with processing difficulties. So they hear the information around them the same as you and I do, but once it gets to their brain, the brain has a hard time making sense of it. Speech and hearing, uh, it should really be speech and language problems. Those are people who might have what is called an ex um, expressive language delay or a receptive language delay. They might have a stuttering or some kind of fluency issue. Intellectual disabilities are individuals who have both a sub-average IQ 
uh, meaning a, a lower than normal IQ, and also have problems doing everyday skills. Emotional behavioral disorders are going to be those adults who might have things like anxiety and depression. They might have obsessive compulsive disorder um, to varying degrees. I think most of us are familiar with what blindness is. Deaf blindness is a dual um, disability where the individual is both deaf and, deaf and blind. Hearing impaired, so you can either have um, you know, a slight problem with hearing or be uh, completely deaf. Multiple disabilities means um, a combination of two or more of the disabilities that I present to you here. Traumatic brain injury means some kind of injury or assault to the head has happened. Other health impaired are things like asthma and diabetes and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And then physical disabilities runs the gamut. Um, you might be familiar with um, cerebral palsy, for example. But the thing that for our presentation today that we want to remember is, is that these individuals that we're talking about who have one of these or more of these disabilities have it to such a degree that they are going to require some kind of support. So I'm really not so much talking about the high functioning um, individual with an autism spectrum disorder who's going to go to college and live independently. I'm talking about the individual who is very, who's been very impacted by it and we have some issues about how that individual is going to uh, function as an adult and be able to live his life or her life at. Okay, so looking at the history of housing adults with disabilities, you know, as someone who works in the field, I have to say, historically speaking, it's been pretty grim. Um, it started with the instant, what is known as the institutional care model for indiv individuals with intellectual disabilities back in 1846. When it was believed that these individuals would benefit from what are called training institutional settings. Now, the concept of institution for institutions for individuals with disabilities is not a happy one. Um, institutions also existed for other reasons at this time, such as places where destitute people could find shelter in exchange for work. Um, but the important thing for us to remember is, is that individuals with intellectual disabilities were viewed as incapable of living in their community. So the idea was, we're going to take these people and we're going to put them in institutions so that they are not integrated in, with society into their community. So doctors advised families to put their family members with ID into institutions. And, um, you know, at this time, they were referred to as feeble-minded individuals and even later mentally retarded, which is not a term that we use anymore. That term has been switched uh, to intellectually disabled. So really, there, was, there might have been the concept of training them to do certain tasks, but there was no schooling for these individuals. All the institutions did was to protect them from you know, you know, the perils of society or whatever was happening in the outside world. And you can see here, I have a picture of uh, Willowbrook State School is what they called it in Staten Island. And you can look at, um, you can see, you know, how the individuals look and, and imagine uh, the treatment that they received, which is probably not the best. So originally, institutions were Victorian structures intended for safety and retreat and refuge. And later they turned into these state hospitals or institutions, but the conditions in them were harsh. And Many people lived in what are known as poor houses or institutions where paupers were maintained with public funds, but they were overcrowded and they were filthy and they were considered to be human warehouses. Um, wealthy families often kept their children at home. And I had an, um, an uncle who was born in the 1920s 
before um, all of these changes that I'm going to talk about have, have occurred. And my grandparents were not wealthy people, but they opted to keep my uncle home um, and out of these institutions um, because they felt it was a more humane thing. There was a strong social desire to isolate these individuals from mainstream society. And I, I bold that for you because we're going to look at what is happening now in terms of housing for people with disabilities, and it's quite different. So eugenics played a role in all of this, the concept of institutions. And they were able to house up to about 14,000 patients at one time. So institutionalized care for individuals with intellectual disabilities or ID really began to shift to what we now call a community living approach when their families thought our children, our adult children with intellectual disabilities should have a better life. They deserve a better life. And that's really what began all of the changes for the better. So we're gonna take a quick look at next at what is something called the Olmstead Act. And the Olmstead Act is um, an act that really, reversed the discrimination that was occurring for individuals with ID who were being put in the institutions. And I think this um, video clip that I'm about to show you is going to really do a good job depicting what it was like. So let's take a look at that together now. Historically, one of the greatest barriers to civil rights for people with disabilities has been institutionalized segregation. Even after passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, segregation remained a pervasive problem. People continued to be isolated in institutions where they often had little or no access to society. Then in 1999, the state of Georgia denied two women, Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson, their request to move out of state operated institutions and into communities of their choosing. The women took their case all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where the final decision became known as Olmstead. On June 22, 1999, the Supreme Court, ruling in favor of Lois and Elaine, determined that unjustified institutionalization is itself discrimination. One of the rationales for why they thought it was discrimination to needlessly institutionalize people with disabilities is that it perpetuates stereotypes and assumptions that people with disabilities are incapable or unworthy of participating in mainstream society. And the Supreme Court got that. Yeah, freedom. Why do you talk about freedom? Because you do a lot of artwork. Yeah. What does freedom mean to you? So I'm let you know about the life use in the institution. For many, the Olmstead decision became the Brown versus Board of Education for people with disabilities. Separate can never be equal, whether the segregation is by race, disability, or any other type of identity. You're going to show us around your home? Yeah, I'm going to show you my home. How do you like your, how long have you been there? I've been there three years. How do you like it? I got 
are all right. When Olmsted was decided, Illinois was one of the most institutionalized states in the country. Ranking 50th in providing services in integrated settings to people with developmental disabilities. Why is it that other states have been able to move people out of institutions and let them live full lives in the community? And why has Illinois continued and persistently fought that national trend? Last year, on the fifth anniversary of the Olmsted decision, 13 disability rights organizations sent a letter to the governor again reiterating our concerns about the lack of community integration services for people with Illinois and the continued institutionalization and asked for a meeting with him to discuss this. We did not get a response to our letter. After five years of inaction from Springfield and an unresponsive governor's office, Equip Quality partnered with Access Living and the ACLU of Illinois to file three class action lawsuits. The first case called Ligus was brought on behalf of people with developmental disabilities living in large facilities, along with people living at home desperately seeking to avoid institutionalization. I think I want to be grow up like mechanic. Change the tires, got a bike. I got to save money for gauge, gauge between power shower. How long have you lived here? 18 years. September 2nd. The second suit called Williams was brought on behalf of people with mental illness living in large facilities called Institutions for Mental Disease. The institution I was at, the IMD, had no incentive in having me get better. They had every incentive as long as I was there not too much of a problem. They got paid $130 a day to have me there. If I got better, they would have to replace me. The third suit, called Colbert, was brought on behalf of people with mental illness and physical disabilities living in traditional nursing homes. I knew when I got there that I wasn't gonna be able to do the things that I wanted to do. Like, go out, visit my family, friends, eat what I want, go where I want, and just do the normal thing that I did before I find my disability. With support from pro bono attorneys at Denton's and Kirkland Ellis, we negotiated consent decrees in all three cases that would systematically provide opportunities for thousands of people with disabilities to live in the community. In the 20 years since Olmstead, Illinois has seen many successes. Thanks to the three consent decrees, nearly 9,000 people with disabilities now live and receive services in the community. Additionally, Equip for Quality's Abuse Investigation Unit compelled Illinois to close two state-operated developmental centers, Lincoln and Howe, after uncovering systemic abuse, neglect, and rights violations. Today, the unit works with the state to monitor individuals transitioning from Illinois' remaining developmental centers into the community. But there is still a long way to go. Thousands of people with disabilities continue to live in institutions throughout the state. Illinois has also violated all three Olmstead consent decrees by failing to move the required number of people into the community or by not providing sufficient resources for those who've already moved into the community. We are encouraged, however, by the Pritzker administration's commitment to fully implement Olmstead and to comply with the three consent decrees. All of us at Equip for Equality look to the 20th anniversary of Olmstead as an opportunity to reflect on the monumental impact it's had on the lives of people with disabilities and we recommit to our goal of ensuring that every person with a disability in Illinois has the freedom and support to live fully actualized lives in the setting of their choice.
Okay, so even though this video clip focuses um, on, on Illinois, this Olmstead Act, of course, um, needs to be implemented throughout the United States. So every state is has to be, um, you know, following the rules that have been set forth by the Olmstead Act. I just want to take a look here at, you know, how this Olmstead Act has affected housing for individuals with disabilities on a national level. Um, and I know that in my personal pursuit of putting together or trying to get started this housing development, I've had to really look at the parameters that are set forth um, by the Olmstead Act. So let's take a moment and look at those. So individuals who have been institutionalized for decades are now receiving services in their community. And that is a huge difference. So that means the institutions are closing down and all of those individuals who live there are now being integrated into the community. Individuals who lost their housing or their community-based support services when they were forced to enter institutions due to an acute health care problem have had the needed services provided or restored. And then individuals with disabilities are now able to access home and community-based services through Medicaid waiver programs. And we're gonna take a look at that briefly towards the end of the presentation, but that's what makes these individuals able to um, move into a more integrated setting. Increased hours of personal care and assistance are being provided to individuals who require additional services to remain in the community. So that is a wonderful thing. That means that we're getting more support. Individuals with disabilities have now have greater control over their community-based care and services, which is what we want, of course, because they are people and they have desires. And individual needs are being met by providing reasonable accommodations in their communities and by not moving them to a more restricted setting. Now, when we say use the term restrictive, which is um, oftentimes used with individuals with disabilities, that means um, as far away from what is considered to be typical or what is considered to be normal. So we want to we want individuals with disabilities to be in a less or least restrictive type of environment. So the, Considering the Olmstead Act and what you folks are probably interested in, I want to look at concerns families have about current housing for adults with disabilities. So I'm imagining that some of the um, families or the parents that you might be working with have adult children with disabilities. And I can tell you these are the issues that they're asking themselves or questioning. First of all, where will my child live during his adult years? How much support is he going to need to live somewhere other than at home? How is he going to pay for his housing? Where is that money going to come from? And who is going to oversee his housing needs when I am no longer alive or available to help him? That really is at the core of parents' concerns when they're talking about their adult child with a disability. So when you're working with them, that is definitely something, these are definitely things that you wanna keep in mind. And I'm sure that these are things that they will want to talk to you about as well. Okay. There are, as we speak right now, about six models that are available for adults with disabilities in the community, okay? So this is not the institution. This is following Olmstead um, and the regulations set forth by Olmstead. The first one is living at home, and that is where you will find the majority of individuals with disabilities living in their adult years. 
some parents or families may modify that house um, in some way to enhance a child's independence. So they might build an addition onto their home that the adult child with a disability will live in. Um, another thing that happens is that the ownership of the home may change over time to the individual. So whereas the parents might own the home while they're alive and the adult child is living there, once they pass away, that child might um, gain ownership of that home. Um, and then he or she would need appropriate support services or people to come in um, once his or her parents pass away to help him sustain that. But by and large, that's where the, the majority of adults with disabilities are living. There's also something called an adult foster home. And this is where the individual lives with a family, not his own family, but another family who has been trained to provide supports um, for adults in their home. And what they do is they assist the adult with these skills of everyday living. So in other words, they're there to help him if he needs help um, making meals or perhaps bathing or getting dressed. You know, it just depends on the level of severity of the individual's disability. But in an adult foster home, that individual with a disability is living with that family who is ready to take on those responsibilities with him or her. I make the note here that currently there is a movement for adults with disabilities to live in integrated community-based settings. So if you remember at the beginning of this presentation, I had mentioned that you know, years ago, and it really wasn't that long ago, the goal was to remove these individuals from society and put them in the institutions, whereas now our primary goal is to integrate individuals into these community-based settings. So just keep that in mind as I move through the rest of this presentation. Another um, housing model, and this is the independent living model. This is the least restrictive option for adults with disabilities. So this means that these folks are able to live like we are able to live. They might live in a home or in an apartment, um, but the individual, for example, if, who has an autism spectrum disorder, who might have limited language skills by definition, has to have the ability to make critical decisions, right? So if you're living independently, you have to not only know that emergency is happening, but be able to respond to that emergency. And so that might include having to know, know how to and be able to call 911. Now, this individual might have a roommate, um, and, and that's fine. You know, that's, that could be part of the model, but direct supervision of the individual or adult with a disability is not required. It's not required. Now, periodic monitoring can go on. Um, they might have an individual or an agency that goes in and takes a look to see that everything is okay, but the, um, the individual probably will receive some kind of ongoing training to help build those independent skills and focus on self-care skills. So um, there still can be a certain level of support, but clearly um, this is the most independent model that exists. Next, we have what is called supported living. And um, I'm sure that some of you might have heard this term before. You might have heard it associated with um, older people. They might go into some kind of supported living situation. And this is going to require more direct supervision of the individual with the disability, the adult. Now, sometimes what happens um, is that there is what we call a pairing of the individual, and again, I'm using autism, with an autism spectrum disorder with another individual. Uh, who might have a disability but doesn't require quite as much support, or it could even be um, a, what we call a neurotypical person. And a neurotypical person is someone like, like ourselves that does not have a disability. 
the amount of supervision that that person might require is really going to depend on the needs of that individual. And I can tell you that the needs of the individual range significantly, excuse me, range um, significantly or can range significantly. So we can't say that all people who live in supported living are going to need this, this, and this. Um, it really is done and looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. A group home, this also um, was, or has been quite a popular model for adults with disabilities. And this is where you have three to six adults living together in a dwelling. Now, currently we would call this the most restrictive of all the housing options. And you say, well, why is that? They're, they're living in the community. Well, they are living in the community. However, they're living with other people um, in, in, exclusively that have disabilities. Now there would be um, some kind of adult, uh, you know, who um, could provide support to them living in the home, but they're really fairly isolated in that dwelling. So we consider that to be restrictive. It, if those three individuals lived with three, uh, excuse me, if those three individuals with a disability lived with three neurotypical people, that would be far less restrictive, okay? Um, it's typically, these homes are typically operated by an agency that is designed to do this or by some kind of private provider, but they are staffed 24 seven. There are, oh, there's always somebody there um, on call for those individuals that live in group homes. And I know um, there still are several in the area where I live um, in operation. Supervised apartments, these are, are really becoming quite popular. These are um, an option for those individuals who enjoy being social, right? So this is where you'll have an apartment um, in a regular apartment complex um, that is just for an individual with a disability. And it requires someone, whether an agency or some kind of provider, um, to really, you know, keep an eye and assess that individual's skill level to make sure that they're able to live in a supervised apartment. But there always is going to be some kind of um, staff available for emergency situations. And this particular model is the model that I'm working on here in Chester County uh, for individuals with disabilities. And now, what the Olmstead Act has said to us, um, this group that I'm working with on this project is, is that in that apartment complex that we are building, 75% of the individuals that live there have to be neurotypical, right? So only 25% of them can have a disability. So, we have to make sure that the individuals who are going to live as individuals with disabilities in this apartment complex have the skills. Someone's going to have to assess them to make sure that um, even though that, you know, there's going to be an emergency person available to them and they might even have their own private support people um, that they hire to come keep, you know, keep track of everything in their lives, that they're able to live in this type of environment, right? So a supervised apartment, it's gaining in popularity. All right, so I have here just a, a two minute clip that I'd like to share with you of what a supportive living environment might look like for an individual with a disability in case you, you don't um, know what that looks like. So let's take a look at this. Frazier is primarily known for its work with kids, but that is only part of the story. Frazier recently organized a full adult mental health department that has developed housing like this in Richfield. Susan Elizabeth Littlefield introduces us to a very proud student resident. 
I like fresh popcorn. Right. A conversation among neighbors may seem simple. You, you've done any more baking? But for Ian Powers, it proves how far he's come. I was more the kid that would go hang out with the teacher at recess and not with the kids. And I never actually had somebody over to my house until I was in high school. Ian has autism, anxiety, and ADHD. He also has a knack for computers and a brand new address. He moved into Fraser's supportive living apartment in Richfield, May, for adults with high-functioning disabilities. It's like you have these great services up to your 18. When you turn 18, everything kind of goes. You're like told you have to figure this out yourself. Each client who lives here gets their own 600-foot, one-bedroom apartment. And as you're about to see, it has what you need. But the greatest perks are not the amenities. They sign the lease, they have the key, and as needed, they can have staff come in and provide services. They're the only group to have housing like this. And it makes them more successful in their own place and helps them to feel more independent. Like Ian, living on his own for the first time at 25 and getting a degree in IT. Because I didn't know if I could do school, but it turned out I just needed the help. I just needed to know where to ask for help. And you found it. Yeah. Here. Mm -hmm. In Richfield, Susan Elizabeth Littlefield, WCCO, 4 News. And Fraser wants to offer more services to adults like Ian. That is why your donations are so important. Okay. So, supportive lot was an example of a nice supported living um, option for that individual with um, an autism spectrum disorder. And again, this could be for any type of disability. Um, I've just chosen to focus on autism because that um, the prevalence of individuals with ASD is skyrocketing, like I mentioned. And um, so we're really looking for available housing for this particular population. So that was one example of a, of a kind of a nice place for that individual to live. And it looked like he was enjoying himself. Okay. So those were the six housing models that we currently have in place. And again, it's, they are fantastic. And the progress that we're making for individuals with disabilities is really tremendous, considering not so long ago, the conditions under which many of them lived. There is something called um, the Fair Housing Act of 1988 that I just want to mention to you. And essentially, this protects people with disabilities from discrimination when they are renting or buying a home, getting a mortgage, seeking housing assistance, or engaging in other housing-related activities. And additional protections do apply to federally assisted housing. And these are all the different individuals that it protects. And as you can see, individuals with disability is listed here. So I am not, um, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know that, uh, that this Fair Housing Act was considered a significant advancement for individuals with disability. So I did want to mention it to you. All right. So um, the last topic I want to spend some time talking to you about, because I, I know that this interests you significantly of your fields, is funding that is available um, for housing for adults with disabilities. And, and right now, there are about four um, different sources of funding that I am familiar with. There might even be more that are, that are out there, but uh, I do want to spend just a second talking to you about them. So the first one is, you know, how, we're trying to answer the question, how are we going to pay for my adult child's apartment or home if he is not going to be living at home? And, and you know, some of this um, would apply to him living at home, and, and I'll get into that in a minute. But the first is private pay. And so I know that many of you are familiar with what is called an ABLE account or um, a special needs trust. And so, but that would be considered private pay. That is that individual's own private money that, you know, that is not coming um, from the government per se. That is that individual's own private money um, to help pay for housing. And, and that, 
you know, when we talk about private pay, we're assuming that that individual has the money or the resources to do such a thing, which is not the case for many. Okay, so the second one, the second source of funding would be um, supplemental security income or SSI. And, and so this is um, money that comes from the federal government if you qualify based on you know, the severity of your disability. And it's a great and wonderful thing, uh, and I'm, I'm not putting it down in any way, but you have to put it into perspective that even if you do qualify, we're talking about somewhere around $9,000 a year um, in, to, to go for housing. So does it help? Absolutely. Um, but think to yourself, wherever you live, whether it be in an apartment or whether it be in, in a townhome or a house, would $9,000 cover what you need it to cover in terms of rent, mortgage, um, and so on? You know, probably not. There's also um, something called um, a Section 8 rental voucher. And these are vouchers that, that you can obtain through your housing assistant programs at the local housing authority that help to pay rent. And this is um, not something that I'm overly familiar with, but I do know that they can offer some type of support for individuals. Now, something I am really quite familiar with are these Medicaid home and community-based service waivers, or HCBS. And um, what happens is, is that they provide money to Medicaid beneficiaries to receive services in their own home or community rather than an institution, but they do not pay rent in mortgage, okay? So, it, they are really about the services that allow the individual to live outside of an institution or a private home. And the uh, waivers come in varying degrees of, um, of, of money, of award. So um, all the way from, you know, maybe 30, about $30,000 a year for one particular type of waiver. And, and I, I say this again, and I, I should, um, state that I'm talking about the state of Pennsylvania right now exclusively because this might vary from state to state. All the way up into um, what we would call an unlimited amount of money depending on that individual's need. And they provide things like in-home support or community support that that individual need. Um, they, they might provide transportation or assistive technology. Um, but this is um, money that becomes available if the individual qualifies um, or is deemed eligible. And that's really the most important concept. And the, one of the, um, that young man, if you recall from the video clip, had said, you know, once I turned 18, I don't have these services or these supports anymore. And there's truth in that, that when an individual with a disability um, is it's school age that they are entitled uh, to certain things, to certain services and to certain, to certain supports by law um, if they are deemed necessary for that individual. When you become 18, things change and you go from being entitled to all of these wonderful things to have to be, to um, having to be eligible for them. And of course, there are very specific criteria for what is considered um, eligible, what makes you eligible for these things. So these are all just you know, very important things to remember. So I just wanna spend a few minutes um, talking to you a little bit about my experience um, for this project, housing project that I'm working on, because I think it's relevant. I personally have um, a 21-year-old in, in, who, who lives with me, a son, who has a developmental disability. And I personally felt that um, he should be entitled to live his own life and that he should be able, because he is able to live 
Um, he has several skills. He's able to live somewhat independently. He should have his own apartment. He should make his own friends and he should have his own life. Not all parents feel that way. And you will come across parents who do, and then you'll come across parents who don't feel that way, who want their child to be home. And that's to be respected as well. And so it was as a result of this that I said, um, you know, there is nothing around where I am that will do what I want it to do for him. And so it was as a result of this, I formed a, uh, a coalition, a group of like-minded family members, um, families, families from other um, surrounding areas where I am who had the same interest. And over the course of a couple of years, we've come together and decided that we are in, going to create such a thing, create such a housing um, apartment complex, following all of the Olmsted rules and so forth. And so um, we are currently in Chester County and we're looking for a site. Um, we're going through different um, applications for funding. Um, and it's just really a very exciting time for us. It's a little scary, but it's very exciting. And, and so I, I, what, I guess my point to you is, is that we've really come a long way for our folks um, and there's still a lot of work to do. However, um, we're getting there and we're, we're, they're getting the treatment and respect they deserve to um, live their own lives and be supported. And for that, I'm very grateful. So at this point, what I want to do, I've given you a lot of information. I'd like to go ahead and open it up to questions um, and talk a little bit to you about things that you want to talk about. So um, I'd like to go and open up the um, Q&A and see what you guys are thinking. All right. All right, so first question has to do with the code for CE credits. And I think that um, you should have the first code that you, there should be a link that's gonna be sent to you. And I'm gonna give you the other one in just a moment. Next, are there existing networks for pairing independent living person with either roommates or other assistance supports? That is a fantastic question. Are there networks? Um, there, I don't know if there are networks specifically for that, but there are, um, there are groups that exist. I don't know how formal those networks are. If you're interested, Glenn, and want to know a little bit more about it, stay on after and I can see what I can do in terms of where you're, where you're living and if I know, if I can point you in the right direction, if you want to know more. Um, Cassandra, what are, where or what resource can we use to see what or how many models may be available in our, in our area? So, great question, um, because when we started this project, we didn't, the one that I'm working on, we didn't know what existed, and we had to do quite a bit of research. So, can I point you to one particular place? No. Um, you really need to search your area um, and, and that can be just start by doing an internet search of that and see, see what is there. Usually when you begin talking to one organization or um, one outfit, they will tell you about others in the area. Where I am, there are a few different um, organizations and network, but um, you know, it depends on how, what type of environment you want your child to live in. For example, our group of parents did not want a provider or an agency in charge of where the, our children were living. We wanted, each one of us wanted to have our children's own particular care providers come and support our child. So it's, that's really going to depend. Um, okay. I, and I don't know, Cassandra, if I, if I answered that, um, but there's no easy, quest, a new, easy answer to that. I don't think we're that far advanced yet, to be honest with you. Um, certainly not in every state, um, unfortunately. Um, in Illinois, the waiver programs can pay for rent. If CILA are used, they can pay them directly. See, that's fantastic, and that's 
And that's what I meant when I said that when I was talking about the waiver program, I was talking about Pennsylvania's waiver program. Um, I, would, I would love if that were the case here. Um, do you know what are the qualifications for, oh yes, there is an income limit. Um, and was the Fraser housing shown earlier benefit from such a program? Okay, so in order to qualify, um, I, I have a, a list of those qualifications um, and I could certainly share the waiver qualifications with you, Rebecca, for Pennsylvania. There is an income limit associated with it. There's also, um, an, I guess you would call it an asset limit. Um, so you can't have more than about $2,000 um, worth of money in your checking account. Um, but again, I'm not a financial person, but I can provide you with that information if you wanna stay on, I'll talk to you about that. Um, and was the Fraser Housing shown earlier benefit from such a program? That I don't know. Unfortunately, um, I, I think it really depends on each individual place. So, um, but hang on, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Do I have any resources that you can share for other parents who would like to do the same things? Um, you, the best thing that I could do, Amy, would be to invite you to um, a meeting and you could listen to us talk. Um, if you have specific questions about different resources, then I could probably help you there. Um, depends, what you, depends what you need. If you're, if you're just starting from the bottom, you know, with starting from scratch, I can talk to you about how to do that. You might also want to hang on and I, can, and I can share that with you. When both parents pass away, does the SSI income change and go up? Dan, I, I am not a financial person. Um, do you know who could answer that for you? Is um, Tom Brinker could answer that for you because he knows all about that. Um, I, would, I would hope, but I don't know. Um, I don't know that. How do you research local availabilities? You would look under um, housing options for adults with disabilities. I do housing options for adults with disabilities. Now, if you know that you are looking for a, under, say for instance, your son or daughter has an intellectual disability. You might go to some of the national organizations like the ARC, who might be able to point you in that direction. But otherwise, I would just do a, I would do a simple search. Um, there are some lists, but again, I'm, I wanna reiterate to you that we are really at the beginning of this type of thing. This is, this is not well established. Many people who are starting these types of housing, um, in apartments, townhouses, really are, don't have an awful lot of models to look to. How do you find the independent living houses? Um, Kristen, that's going to depend on where you live. So, um, you know, independent, when you talk about it, um, an independent living house, okay, I think I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. An independent living house can be any house. So it's not, it's not um, a group of houses like maybe a supported living is. Independent living means the individual is living independently and can have supervision um, or have any kind of support to the amount that they want, but that's something that they will um, provide it for themselves individually. That is not something that's going to come from, um, you know, from the actual dwelling or the people that run the dwelling. They would have their own place. Okay, I'd like to know that to have a client looking for her son. Um, so Hannah, to answer that, if, if I knew a little bit more about that son, that child, then maybe I could point you in the right direction. So if you remember, when we looked at the supported living model with that child who had, was very what we would call high functioning or able, um, that he didn't have an awful lot of needs. He, he had a lot of skills, but not every child with a disability is going to present that way. You might have a, a child who has intense medical needs. And so 
that individual is going to need a different kind of housing um, to be successful. So without knowing who that person is, it, it's hard for me to um, suggest that. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, the arc of, uh, okay, the arc, I just mentioned the arc, yes. Barbara, are the criteria for qualifying for home and community-based service waivers generally similar to qualifying for SSI or is it really very different state by state? I can only tell you about the state I live in. Um, and I found that the qualifying or getting a waiver is much, much more involved because you're, you're potentially also talking about a lot of money. You know, um, if you have, say, the, um, um, and I'm trying to think of the community-based waiver, which is one in, in Pennsylvania, that's $70,000 a year of support. That's a lot, and that's a lot different than SSI coming in at about 9,000. So it is, it's took us personally um, a year and a half through the application process to get that particular waiver for my son. And, um, and so it, it, there's a lot in the application. It's, it, it's a lot. First of all, you know, for example, just to go back to SSI for a minute, um, part of that application for SSI is, is that you have to prove that, that your child is what you call incapacitated. And what that means is that they're unable to take care of themselves or live independently. Um, and that, that can kind of be a touchy thing to do, you know, and a difficult thing to do um, I mean, from an emotional standpoint. But anyway, I would say that waivers are much more involved than SSI, at least they, have, they were for me. Um, Stephanie, how can we help organizations get funding? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, to open new group living situations for senior disabled. How can we help? Well, I think first you have to do is, what you have to do is be able to connect to them. A lot of times what they do to comply with Olmstead is they put seniors and individuals who are disabled together. But I know that you're speaking about senior disabled, right? Um, you have to be able to connect with them first. And so that, again, would require you to take a look and see what is a, a, around where you're living. Um, but let me tell you, whoever, were, whoever you connect with would love to talk to you about, uh, about that topic. Um, Anthony, there are nonprofit organizations that offer group homes, group homes in my area in Palm Beach, Florida. There are seven homes. One will be built specifically for autism. Yeah. So in, in back to the, the issue of autism, once again, we're looking at, you know, if you have one in 50 some odd individuals who are on the spectrum, you know, these people, all these people grow up to become adults on the spectrum who are going to need support. So it, it's going to be um, pretty overwhelming in terms of housing. Yeah. Okay. A couple more. The ARC in each state can give you a list of their housing options. Yes, I did mention that. Um, Deborah, the biggest challenge my clients face is integrating their adult child in the community, especially work, without jeopardizing benefits, including housing funding. There, are, there may be less family support and greater need for outside support in the future, but current income can impact future benefits. Any thoughts about how to plan with an eye on both current and future housing needs? So again, just so that you understand, the, the adult child with a disability is the one that they're looking at in terms of money. So even though he is, um, you know, maybe his parents or guardians, we're looking at the individual with a disability in terms of the money that he has, not his parents. Um, so their adult child with work, yeah, you're only allowed, your adult child with a disability is only allowed to make a certain amount of money, for those of you that don't know, in, and still maintain all of his or her benefits. 
Uh, you, do, you need to be very aware, I would say, of um, what you, you, that individual is making and, and what he or she can make. And I know that um, particularly with SSI, I think there is, um, they, there are calculations that you can do to determine how much they can make. And then because the more they make, uh, the less SSI they're going to get. So there are calculations for that. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, I'm going to take one or two more. Um, can you transfer one state's funding to another state? Or do you have to start all over? I have no idea. Again, I'm, I'm not a financial person. That's a good, that's a good one. I would say, I, I, I bet they make you start all over. I don't know if there's some kind of reciprocity. Um, that I don't know. Um, can I share any information on helping other groups or parents start their own housing developments? You're in PA. Becky, where are you? Are you close by? Um, information sure I sure I would love to but that's something again that I would need to sit and talk to you about happily I would do that all right last one I have a client in Harrisburg looking for housing for their adult child your project sounds very promising is there any way someone may contact you Michael yeah sure um, you know um, if you look on the um, the college website um, there's my contact information should be there and I'd be happy to talk to parents. So yes, um, that would be great. And so I really am going to have to stop now. I knew I, I should have allowed a little bit more time. Um, I wish I could get to all of your questions. Um, again, I don't have all the answers, um, but it's something that I'm very passionate about and I'm very glad that you folks took the time today um, to listen to what I had to say and really learn a little bit more about housing concerns and adults with disabilities. So you all take care. Thanks very much.